Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this month's rendition of the chat with the grad dean. And I'm so excited today to have a couple of folks with me because we have an interesting topic for discussion, which we'll launch into in a little bit. But I do have the pleasure of having two of our operations faculty with us. Of course, our assistant dean for academic operations, Dr. David Whitefield, is here. And then I am so excited to have Dorothy Han Han, Dr. Dorothy Han Han, who also teaches in the area of operations management with us. She is our featured guest speaker today, and I have some interesting questions for her. But before we get there, I'm sure if you are on campus uh, attending uh, this grad dean session live, you just heard the siren go off on the first Wednesday of every month. It always uh, makes us jump a little bit. So if you heard that loud siren in the background, it's just our monthly test going on. Everything is A-OK -okay here on campus. So folks, we're post Thanksgiving. We're on the edge of finishing final exams for students and going into exam week for other students. So I know that for many of you, um, you're exhausted, uh, you've been managing all the details, getting to the bitter end and really looking forward to a holiday. You know, this will be um, the first holiday in quite a while. I mean, I guess Thanksgiving was the first one, but the second one where we can really kick back and maybe hopefully have more of a normal time off in terms of how we convene and coalesce with each other. And I hope that you will do that. I hope that during the break, you'll get out and socialize with your friends. You'll you'll all be socially distanced and protected. And, and, I, and I really hope, uh, we cannot mandate, but I hope that many of you that are watching this webinar have gotten your vaccines and, and are protected and will stay safe uh, during the holiday before we get back together. Please note for all of you, there are a couple of important announcements. Number one, please look at the academic calendar for spring. You will notice a significant difference in the start date for this spring versus spring of 2020. We are actually starting classes an entire week earlier. So don't assume it's the same schedule as we had last spring because it, uh, it is not. We are, we are commencing classes a little bit earlier than we um, uh, did last year. So pay attention to that. Also, during this break time, when you have a moment and you know, you've watched that uh, rom-com movie and you're kind of having an overdose on romance and, and adventure, um, be sure to take time to go and pull syllabi for your spring classes and read over those syllabi. Look at um, what you're going to cover. Look at what the, the grading assignments are going to be. Look at the faculty that are going to be teaching it. If you're going to make decisions to add and drop classes, you don't want to wait until after you've attended two classes to make those decisions. So most of the time students are a little bit delinquent about reading that syllabus until the very first day of class when the professor goes over it. Read it earlier. You'll have a better sense of whether that uh, elective course makes sense for your career objective and you'll 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 be settled into your spring classes a lot earlier. So be sure to do that. Um, one additional reminder before we get into our, our, our guest visitors for the day is if you are in a situation where you're concerned about your academic performance in a particular class in this fall semester, um, please be in contact with your faculty member about your performance. Um, and, and if need be, um, you know, there's there's not anything you can do about dropping that class. But if you have a comprehensive final exam, or an exam for which you can, you know, take some action to improve your, your performance. Please don't wait. Do that right now. Uh, uh, time is ticking by in order to have that impact. Don't forget to get those last projects in. Um, you know, don't forget to tie up all the loose ends that you uh, may have. So Norma, who is our back office uh, wonderful producer and keeps us all live and online, uh, Norma has uh, indicated to everybody in chat that you can pose any questions you have that you want to ask. So Norma, do we have any questions right at this moment before we launch into our guest speakers? We actually do. We have one question. Um, what are the university plans if the new COVID strain hits the U.S. hard? Are there chances of getting back to virtual classes? Wow, what a great question, and I should have expected that question. So it is our hope and it is our expectation that um, the Om Omicron um, variant 
will be the same as the Delta variant, that we will, you know, that we will find out that the vaccines are very effective toward um, that variant and and everything that we're concerned about will end up being moot. That That is certainly my hope and expectation. I think that's everybody's hope and expectation. We will know that better in the next couple of weeks when they have more data to determine if, um, if that variant is uh, positively affected by the vaccinations. So we're gonna know in a couple of weeks, but let's just go to where you want me to go, which is what happens if it is not a good outcome? The university has gotten very good at pivoting very quickly. Um, so if we need to do something in response to a, a difficult variant, the university is going to be prepared to do that. Do I think that's going to happen? No, because I'm the hopeful and ridiculously enthusiastic individual who is going to believe positively that it's not. But if that should happen, we will go where the university needs to go to protect um, our students, our faculty, and, and our staff. And we will be very upfront about how we communicate that. Please be in mind, be mindful of the COVID-19 uh, resource page, which you can get to right off the main UT Dallas page. It will always have the latest information um, right there. I'm curious, uh, uh, Dorothy, Dorothy, who's one of our guests here today, and, and David, what do you guys think about that? Dorothy, what do you think about that question? I'm also an optimist, so I also <laughs> don't really want to go there as to what's going to happen, but I'm also very confident that the university, given the past, I know the university will take the right action if, if need be. So, um, yeah, I want to think positively that we'll be fully in person uh, again in the spring, uh, but, and I hope I'm not wrong, but I'm like you. I just want to, I don't want to think about <laughs> The worst, but at the same time, I, I'm confident if if some if if this new variant is really bad, then I know I I trust the university to take the right actions. So. Yeah, we have gotten really good. It's kind of amazing if you think about all the pivoting that the university has done um, during the last 20 months. It's kind of amazing. In two weeks, we went to fully online. Then we pivoted again, where we had you know, a small proportion of classes that were on campus and they were hybrid. And then we were doing everything else remote. And then we we went to four or five different modalities and we delivered that. And then we went back to face to face this fall, you know, making accommodations as we needed to for people who were exposed to COVID-19. So I think we've gotten really good at being quite elastic. Uh, and so I think that if if something did happen, we're going to transition beautifully to whatever that response needs to be. And our faculty have gotten really good at it, too. So uh, so we will definitely take care of that. Um, Norma, any other questions that have been put in the chat? Not right now. Well, terrific. So so let's launch into for any of you students that watch uh, our monthly uh, chat with the grad dean, you know that we can go anywhere in our conversation. So I wanted to engage uh, both of uh, these terrific operations faculty to have a discussion with me uh, from a faculty perspective. I think it is really important for students to always welcome and solicit feedback on you know, what are the characteristics that I could have that can help me be successful when I move out into the corporate world? Now, you guys know if you watched the last session that I did, I talked a, a little bit about the top six things that I think students need to work on, but I wanna go beyond that. And so I really wanna hear it from, from people that have a great reputation um, in their classes and with students, and students love both uh, Drs. Whittafield and, and Han Han, and hear from them about you know, what do you guys observe that is ineffective in terms of characteristics? And then what are the characteristics that you think really define, you know, the successful student that'll then, you know, translate out into the real world and really define a successful uh, new hire at a company? So, Dr. Han Han, why don't you give us some of your ideas? <clears throat> yeah, so I, I look back at the students that, so I, I get asked a lot to write letters of recommendations for some of my students. Um, and I look back at what makes me write a really good letter versus just a good letter. Uh, and I think these are typically the students that show 
the most passion. The students that would email me when they find an article that's relevant to class topic and oh, I just read this and this is great. Uh, or they come in the chit chat with me at the break and it's it's really like they're interested in knowing more about a topic and really passionate about something. Uh, these are not necessarily the students that get the highest grades. So I've written some of the best letters for students who got a B in my class or even C in my class. I can sort of tell the, the difference between their ability to do what I teach, which is very specific because my class is a very analytical and mathematical. Uh, so some students brain is just not the right fit for what I teach and I appreciate that and they're good at other things, but I see in them, you know, passion. I see in them the will to start a company or, you know, they have all these other skills and I can recognize that they will be successful. And so I can write a letter that does not mention the grade <laughs> and it doesn't sound like something's missing. I, could, I'm, I, could, I think I'm really good at that. Um, but these are typically students who I will, I will remember their name within the first two, three weeks because they're sort of stand out. They, yeah, they just want to go a little bit beyond the material or they're, they're curious or they're passionate um, and and I, I get the sense that the grade is, is important to them because it should be, but it's not what's driving them. They're also in there to to learn, to make connections, to, you know, just really enrich themselves. So, um, yeah, and what an interesting thing I did one year, I think pre COVID, right before COVID, I um, in the first day of class, I pulled my students and I asked them, what is your goal in this class? And the options were something like get an A, learn something or both, right? And at the end of class, I sort of looked in Excel and saw who did the best versus the answer they gave to that question at the start of the semester. Uh, and the students that were really interested to get an A, typically they all, they did good, uh, but also the students that were really interested in learning. Uh, and the people that said both somehow, I think it was statistically significant, they were a little bit lower uh, in, in their total grade at the end. Um, and so I think these are really two types of students. They're really academically motivated students and they might also be really good at the kind of topic that I teach, but then also the, people with a passion for learning, and these guys could also be really successful. Um, you know, um, Dorothy, that's really interesting to me. In the last uh, grad session that I did, I talked about um, the importance of grit and that grit is sometimes a lot more important than like sheer intellect. And I, and I think that you are right. I think, um, you know, we tell students all the time from day one that if you focus solely on getting a 4.0, and you don't invest in building passion or working with others or getting involved, you're not getting all that you are paying for, that yeah. you're supposed to be de uh, developing everything. And so, you know, um, David, I'm gonna pitch to you now because I know in my 35 years of being in graduate management education, only one time has an employer, and it happened to be McKinsey Consulting, only one time has an employer ever called me about a student's academic uh, um, performance versus what you are talking about, Dorothy, this grit, this passion, this desire to learn, this, you know, being excited about being in the profession. And of course, we can never talk to an employer about your academic performance because FERPA prohibits us from doing that. But I've only had one situation where an employer tried to do that, and it was for McKinsey. And that was many, many years ago. So David, can, can you help convince students that maybe focusing solely on the grade misses the point? <laughs> and I think, uh, Dorothy, your experiment is really quite revealing um, that you did in your class in asking him that question. Uh, David, what is, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, sure. Um... Am I on mute? No, I'm good. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's great. And, and I liked like, some of the points that Dorothy was making as well. Um, 
particularly when she was talking about the, the request for letters of recommendation. I, I get the same thing and, and I agree with her. It's the students who may not be the A or A plus students in your class that make the biggest uh, impact and, and uh, on you as, as a faculty member and the ones who seem to be naturally curious and try harder, even though they may struggle with the material, they try a lot harder. So I think that was, that, that was some, some great feedback, um, Dorothy, about, about going out and doing an, an LOR. Um, as far as from an employer side, I mean, having worked in, in, in retail for you know almost 22 years, um, one of the things that I, I think that, back to your point, Monica, about employers asking about your academic performance, no employer, even as a hiring manager, I never asked somebody to show me your transcripts and what was your GPA, what was your CGPA or what was your GPA in certain classes. What I was looking for is that did you finish a, a degree, a, a, a field of study and, and, and earn the degree? Do you have specific skills? How did you demonstrate that you can use those skills either in the classroom or in a practical setting? How did you do that? And this is a conversation I have with the uh, supply chain students and master's supply chain students all the time. Um, a lot of them come in and get very focused on the grades. And like you, Monica, I've only had one employer in my professional background ever ask me for my grades and that was Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> they asked, they asked me for my CGPA at my undergrad and my grad level, which I looked at the guy and I said, uh, he was the VP of, of HR and, and, and his name was Joe. And I said, Joe, I said, this is crazy. I said, I'm a 38 year old guy. And I said, I've graduated. I've got, I, I've been in, in retail now at that time I was, I was in retail for 15 years. And I said, I'm not quite sure. I understand how that is it's just our corporate policy. We have to see everybody's grades for the most part to your point, Monica, you're absolutely right except for those um, those kind of more elite consulting type firms, uh, McKinsey being one of them. Um, occasionally I've heard Deloitte has been doing this uh, for certain roles. Um, outside of those, most employers, they're not going to ask for your grade. And, and I try to reiterate this to the, to the students all the time. Um, they're not gonna be looking to see, did you get a B or an A and, and kind of slice it that way. They're really gonna be looking for those skill sets. And, and I really see that again and again and again with the number of, of letters that I have to write in support of either green card applications or H-1B applications. I have two of them right now that I've got to write. And all this, all the employer is asking me to confirm is that that student completed these courses uh, with either in, in analytics or strategy or whatever the track is in supply chain and that I validate that those transcripts and that, that that's true. So I think I can't talk enough the grades. And I love how you do that, Monica, each orientation. You say, hey, don't come here and do nothing but focus on the grades and go on to class. Take time out to get engaged, get out there, learn. And a B is okay. It's, it's all right. And I know a lot of students don't want to hear that, but it, the Bs are okay. They really don't, David. And it's quite shocking. And it seems... It seems like it's almost impossible to convince students to, to not focus that way. You yeah. know, companies hire people that are a fit for their organization. They would not be interviewing you. They're interviewing you to find out if you're a fit. Yeah. They wouldn't select you to interview if, if they thought that a, a 3.5 is a problem versus a 3.9. Uh, but it's really a challenge to convince them of that. You know, really one of is. the things that I have observed uh, to both to both of our faculty that I have observed of students, and I think it's a uh, a bit of a uh, an outcome from COVID. I think COVID has had some negative effects on our graduate population in the sense that it has been they've become a little bit more introverted. I think they they feel a lot more exposed in a virtual environment. And so they have a lot of reluctance to turn on their cameras. They have a lot of reluctance in the classroom to look above their laptop. <laughs> um, so I'm curious if both of you have observed that as faculty and, and how would you su support my proposition that you have to get comfortable in this virtual world that this is going to be the way it is going forward. Dorothy, have you seen that in your classes? Yeah, I have. And to some degree, I understand it. I mean, I, I, I know I have to attend seminars and other meetings and sometimes when it was still the option of, you know, previous semesters or earlier this semester, you can either come to class or you can stay at home. 
I've had meetings like this where I would debate, do you want to stay at home or do you want to go? I really want to go and be in person because I know that's the best way to be listening all the time. But I would have to drive, I would have to dress, I would have to put on makeup. <laughs> you know, I would have to also pay attention the whole time at the meeting because when it's virtual, sometimes somebody asks a question that's not directly relevant to me. I can doze off for a second, answer an email, but that's the wrong thing to do because I lose focus. I lose I, what's being discussed. Usually it takes me more time than than I thought it would to do that little thing that would just take two minutes and then I'll get back to the meeting. But no, by the time I'm back, I lost something crucial. And I don't feel like I'm connected anymore and I don't want to participate anymore. So I've been guilty of that. And so it's so easy to just stay in your PJs all day and and take class from your bedroom <laughs> when it's an option. But I think you really have to force yourself. Uh, it's, it's like eating healthy, you know, you you know this is the right thing to do and you, you want to put all these things in place to lead you to the right decision. And so I think going to class, you know, getting dressed, putting on makeup, driving is important to be in the classroom and force yourself to be paying attention. Uh, now, it's true that in the classroom, there are students that are, they are there, but they're on the laptop and I, they could be doing something else. It's so easy to be hidden behind your laptop. Um, but I think it's so, first of all, I think that class is much more enjoyable and it goes by a lot faster when you pay attention. If you're doing something, you know, pay attention, you're just looking at the clock and it's going to take forever. I remember when I was a student in my undergrad, I remember having to go to math class and I hated that class and I would just write everything down and not really try to understand on the spot and I would just go home and do the work and try to understand and then one day I said I'm going to try to listen and try to understand today <laughs> and class went by twice as fast it was so much more fun and I said from now on I'm going to pay attention <laughs> and it was a conscious decision and I think it's students that you know they come because they have to come because there's a quiz or there's attendance um, if they were to make that conscious decision, today I'm going to force myself to try to pay attention and see where it leads me. I think it's going to lead you to understanding the material better and enjoying class a lot better too. You'll laugh when people laugh and get the joke and you, you know, just look at the clock. Oh, it's over already. Whereas when you're just there because you have to be there, just time goes by so slow. So yeah, you know, that I think is it's all about forcing yourself. You, uh, it, it, Dorothy, it's like you're in my office and you're in my head and you knew exactly where I was going. Uh, so your segue into my into my next uh, statement and then question was like so orchestrated that it, it's unbelievable. Um, you know, so I am really candid with students about how long I've been in this industry and my age. I'm 61 years old. Now in my head, I'm about 31, but my birth certificate says I'm 61. So, so in my generation, when I graduated from an undergrad, which by the way was in 1982, and my master's was I think in 84, I don't remember when my PhD was, but nonetheless, when I came out of school, we didn't have all the technology. We barely had computers. Uh, we definitely didn't have email. But in those days, in a time where there were not a lot of women in academic administration, and, and I was a bunch with a bunch of old men, <laughs> Um, and so I really stood out being really young and a little bit loud, a little bit overly enthusiastic. But one thing that really mattered in those days was something that we called FaceTime. Mm -hmm. So when you went to work in a, a corporate environment or even in academia, what mattered was being seen. It was equated with being present and being productive. So this kind of goes to what you're you're saying, Dorothy, that that being present matters, whether it's virtual or whether it's in the classroom, being present matters. Now, I don't think that FaceTime, where in order to get promoted in the 80s, it was all about FaceTime. How early were you at work and how late did you stay at work? And there wasn't anything about work-life balance in those years. You were just there. And so uh, FaceTime really mattered. And I'll give you a good example of that. You know, when I started working in ac academia, I worked ridiculously long hours. I still work ridiculously long hours. But the point that I'm trying to make is that that 
even though I worked ridiculously long hours. Later, when I stopped working as many because I, I had three kids while I was in academia and, you know, three children, people still perceived that I was working ridiculously long hours when I wasn't. But part of that was because you created this idea that that's how you work and it and it lended to your uh, to your reputation. So to respond to what you said, Dorothy, if you are going to be virtual or if you are going to be present, I mean, physically present, you must be present regardless, because I think you made a really good point. The moment that you aren't disciplined to be present is the moment that you aren't seen as being present or believed to be present. So, you know, I, I badger students all the time about believing that that some portion of your future job is going to be in this setting virtual, just like we are right now. And by George, you better get used to looking at the dot on the camera and, you know, having your setup and being comfortable in this environment and turning your camera on because that then obligates you to be present. You can't cheat when the camera is on you. Um, you you can't, uh, you know, people know if you're doing whatever that you're doing. So if you're going to be there and you're going to be committed, be committed all the way there. Um, so, Dorothy, your comments were perfect. I think you're absolutely right. When you invest by being in class and you invest in the conversation, you invest in the relationships, you invest in the knowledge, everything is so much more fun and you just grow so much more. So, um, so that's one aspect of being present. Um, David, do you think that that technology is impacted young people today in with regard to their writing capabilities because that's another observation i have is that students don't write as much anymore and i am of the belief that the the written word has not been replaced by a an abbreviated text message with a bunch of emojis that i think students don't realize that when they go into the corporate world they are going to have to read their email. And I think that's one of you know the biggest complaints I hear is that, well, I told the students the exam was not going to happen this week. It was going to happen next week. And then I got a bunch of complaints and they didn't read their email where I told them that. So David, what, what do you think about the written word and whether or not students are investing enough time to develop the ability to write a good email or just communicate in something other than an emoji? Which, by the way, I don't understand emojis. <laughs> Somebody sent me an emoji today and I'm going to have to ask normal. What in the heck does that emoji mean? Because I have no idea what that thing means. So anyway, David, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think it definitely has. I mean, I'm thinking about my own children. They range from age of 26 down to 19. And and uh, yeah, I think it's definitely had an impact, particularly in like the courses that I teach where I do have, you know, uh, formal written assignments that have to be turned in. And, you know, the, the first assignment they'll get back and, you know, there's there's a lot of comments on there about, you know, this isn't right structure and you're not including all the points. Uh, I get maybe a three sentence paragraph, uh, very generic about a concept. Um, I think that, that the technology has definitely impacted it. Um, I think it's it's in some of the things that I do with my students is I try to tell them, like, there's informal writing, then there's formal writing. And I said, you know, from our assignments, those are more formal and you're going to have to expand out, like, you know, state your argument, but then what's the logic behind that? How are you supporting that argument? And where did that actually come from? Whether it's coming from the class lecture or it's a, an external data point, uh, where's that coming in? Because quite frankly, I said, I can't count how many times when I was presenting a solution or a new system or a new process in, in the business world, I would have executives firing uh, questions back to me. Where did that come from? Who's doing that? Where's the source for that? Um, where can I read more about that? Can you provide me with those references? I said, that's going to happen. And particularly for anybody who wants to go into consulting, I can tell you guys that is commonplace. Uh, having done a lot of consulting engagements already. So I think that the the Electronic technology has definitely, um, I, I hate to use the word dumb down, but it really has dumbed down a, a lot of the communication that we see. Um, and and I'm, I myself am as guilty as, as just as the students, I do the same thing. Whether I'm reading it or doing an email or doing a text, I, I do the same thing. I use the abbreviated words. I'll throw the emoji on there just to put a point on there and then send it out. Yes, I use emojis. My wife converted me. Um, 
but no, I think I think it really has. Uh, I want to go back. You, you know, Dorothy made a great point, um, and actually, you did too, Monica. Both of you did about this being there in the classroom, and I absolutely agree with that. I think it's too easy to hide behind the technology. Whether you're sitting in the classroom with a laptop opened up or on a virtual uh, class, and you have your camera. Uh, turned off. Uh, yeah, make sure that you're there. And then I liked what Dorothy was saying about getting engaged with the classes. You know, one of the things that I do, and I, I know it really makes people uncomfortable in my classes, if I'm the only one talking for an hour and 15 to two hours and 45 minutes, and sometimes in the executive side for four and eight hours at a time, that's real dull, real quick. I will ask questions and purposely start picking people to start answering and providing that back. Um, I'll even do some un uncomfortable silences. And I'm going to say, OK, we're not going forward until someone speaks. <laughs> uh, but I think what we're finding out is it, and, you know, I've gotten a lot of feedback this semester in the courses that I'm teaching that they really uh, like that for that that engagement and, and being able to really kind of explore a topic um, from their own perspective. The, uh, back to your point again. Uh, Monica, about the technology, I think students are, are unsure about when we're talking about a concept um, and don't feel comfortable, they're, they'll look it up on the technology side. And if you Google, I don't know, let's just take, I don't know, economic order quantity calculation. If you go Google that, I mean, you've got like millions of hits all over the place. And, and I think it's, it's, you know, how do you feel comfortable about using that type of technology? Um, oftentimes, just be comfortable, be confident, jump out there if the instructor asks you a question or, or, or throws something out. Add to that discussion because nine times out of 10, you're going to find out that it's going to be a much more enjoyable experience. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think the technology is definitely, um, definitely having a, uh, an impact on the way we communicate. And, and like I said, I'm as guilty as anybody else. Well, I, I don't know how long it's going to take me to learn emojis. I just figured out that one emoji is not chocolate pudding. It's actually poop. So that tells you how, <laughs> how just not good I am with emojis. But I, I will share with the students that that my first week in graduate school, the dean of the school was talking to the new incoming students and he said, hi, I am your dean and I am going to give you your first assignment. And um, and he did. And he asked all of the students who were coming into that master's program, I want you to write um, a story about the best advice you've ever been given to date in your life, and you must do it in 350 words. Best advice. And we were all like, hey, that's a piece of cake. We're communications people. You know, hey, I can I can write. And in my case, I chose an anecdote. He says, I will, I will, um, I, I turn these in in a week. You cannot go one word beyond 350 words. Now, remember in those days, we didn't have word count, or any of that. We actually had to count all the words. So the next week we turned it in and Dean Mullins thanked us and said, hey, this is great. Thank you for turning these in. He said, okay, I'm handing them back out. Turn them in next week at 250 words. Same story, 250 words. Next week we come to class. There's Dean Mullins again. Okay, folks, this is great. We now have it at 250 words. Now I'm giving them back you got to do that same story and give it to me in 150 words. And then next week you'll turn in all three. That was the most powerful learning experience I think I've had. Now, granted, that 21 hours of stat courses I took in my PhD permanently altered my brain in a way that I can never recover from. But in terms of being able to write and to be concise, and to choose my words carefully and to get rid of excess. I think one of the biggest problems with students either they write in emojis and I can't figure out what in the heck they said, or they write so verbosely that I can't figure out what they said. So I encourage all of you to try that exercise. Take the best advice your grandma, your mom, your Uncle Joe gave you and try to get it from 350 words down to 150 and you'll realize the, the the duplications that you're making in your writing, you'll realize that that one word is better than four. And all of a sudden you'll be able to to make your writing efficient. I think the reason that students don't like to write is the same reason they don't like to read email. It's hard work. When you can do a Google search and get your answer in three words, it's hard to write an email that's longer than three emojis. So I think it's a, a life skill that will be effective with how you communicate with your faculty. Uh, you know, 
Dear Dr. Han Han, um, I appreciate the um, the overview you gave on the topic of X. I do not understand X, Y, and Z. Please offer me some guidance. To, to write more concisely and correctly saves you time and also means you'll get a response a lot faster. So Dorothy, now that we went where we went on, on written communication, what is your perspective on that? Well, I just want to add one thing. Uh, I have a lot of students who are international students and I came to this country as an international student too. And I remember when I came like 20 years ago, my English was far from perfect and I don't I still don't think it's perfect, but I had an accent. I wasn't sure about certain words. I was self-conscious. Sometimes I didn't want to speak because I, I knew I was going to use the wrong word. And I think I see that in a lot of my students, um, those for whom English is not the native language or even if, if it's an accent also. Um, and so sometimes they're a little bit afraid to write um, and, and I can sense that. So I, I it's good to put emphasis on writing, but at the same time, I, I want to send the message to international students that, you know, um, don't be too self-conscious about your English and make sure sometimes it's okay to write and make mistakes. You know, it's it's more important to try than if you're too shy and you don't say anything. Uh, that, that could be a problem. So yeah, so the, the rules are kind of different for, for international students. I think I'm, I'm much more tolerant of an email that doesn't really make sense <laughs> or there's some sentences that are not perfect. It's OK, right? I've wrote, and I I've think I think before. that really, Dorothy, brings up the other challenge that I think young people have today. I think there is such pressure on young people today to be perfect. Be perfect yeah. in how they speak, be perfect in how they write, be perfect in their grades. And I think that I think that's unfortunate because I think that when we grow the most is when we aren't perfect. And so, you know, Dorothy, I love the story you said about coming to this country and, you know, 20 years ago and having an accent and maybe feeling really self-conscious. I lived my childhood outside of the country, so I had the reverse effect. I'd go to these you know, countries where, you know, I could say 10 words in that language and I was way off in terms of accent. But but I think that um, I think that giving yourself some grace and realizing that there is no better place in the world to get better at all the things you're not good at than right here. This right. is the safest environment. So don't don't limit yourself by fear of not doing it perfectly or writing it perfectly, because when you practice it, that's where that's where you get better at it. And, and so I, I want to really encourage all of our international students that are out there, you know, to to raise your hand, practice, practice. Um, nobody in this environment, I mean, we we're right here in the middle of the United Nations of graduate business schools in the world. We have students from, I think, 72 countries in our graduate programs this fall. This is the safest place to open up your mouth and have that conversation, and nobody is going to judge you for that. And, mm -hmm. you know, and people are going to be so willing um, to assist and to help and to make you feel comfortable. But I do think that American employers, who are also global employers, are are going to expect students to have practiced and improved that. Mm -hmm. So this is the environment that I would encourage students to do. This is a safe zone <laughs> because no one's going to no one's going to grade your email message. <laughs> um, that, that, that's not going to happen. And, and we're always going to be uh, willing to help you to improve that. What is um, uh, Dorothy? What is what is maybe the number one thing? And I know that I'm asking you this question, not giving you any heads up which might make you a little bit uncomfortable after I ask the question. But what is the one piece of advice you've always wanted to give to graduate students that maybe you never have had the opportunity to give them? And David, you think about the same answer because I know that you know, students ask me that question all the time. And I think the thing that that I always say when I'm asked that question is that that you you really have to put yourself out there to welcome criticism and to welcome feedback because when you know where you can improve and when you know where you fell short that's where you make the biggest gains in your life and i think students are often nervous about 
really having somebody be direct with them. And so I tell students all the time, I mean, and I may have told this story before to our students, but many years ago we had a student who applied to be on the Dean's Council. And she interviewed with a group of Dean's Council people three times. And she never got picked to be on the Dean's Council. And so right before she graduated, she came to my office and she was a really good student. I mean, she had done a great job uh, while she was here in the program. And she said, Dr. Powell, you know, I always wanted to be on the Dean's Council, but I never could quite make the case to be on there. Would, would you tell me candidly what I could have done better? And the first thing I said to her was, kudos to you. You're asking the question. You're not going to be defensive about the answer and you are seeking an opportunity to learn something about yourself. So the very first thing I wanted to do was just like hug her and say, I'm so glad that you <laughs> asked the question. So I told her, I said, you are incredibly passionate. You have so much passion that when you talk about the things you're passionate about, your face looks angry and mad. You look, <laughs> you just look like you're angry about something. And when people see that, they interpret that as meanness. And, and you're not mean at all. You're this wonderful gal, but you've, and she looked at me, you know, with that mean kind of face. And she goes, <laughs> oh my gosh, I've never looked in the mirror. And I said, go home today, sit in front of your bathroom mirror and interview yourself and look at your facial expressions and try to be aware of putting a smile on your face, raising your eyebrows or vocal intonation, but just be aware that your passion comes off as anger. And um, so she she went home. She was really grateful. She wasn't upset about that feedback, which I was happy about. She went home and I didn't hear from her for a while. A couple years later, she came back as an alum and she said, you know, Dr. Powell, that advice led me to be so much more aware of how I was perceived by others. And I really believe that I've been able to get promoted several times since I graduated because I had that awareness. I've also found that I have a lot more friends. <laughs> and so this characteristic that she didn't know she had, had affected her social life and affected how people perceived her, but nobody ever asked for it. So. Mm -hmm. So that is what I tell students. So Dorothy, David, have you thought of the one thing that you might tell students that you've not been in a position to tell them? That's a hard question. Yeah, I'll let Dorothy go on first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, something that I've been in a position to tell them, but I mean, it's not, I, I really say it one-on-one, -on -one, but to come back to what we said at the beginning, I would just say, just don't, Focus on the grades, focus on the experience, on the learning, on the networking, on the putting yourself out there for just growing intellectually and making friends. And you you learn in the classroom, but you learn just as much as out of the classroom when you work with friends on a homework assignments, when you talk about other people. You say 72 different countries, uh, you learn so much from interacting with different cultures. So this is also part of the learning experience. It's not just the, the EOQ model that was mentioned earlier or whatever you're <laughs> learning in class. There's all these other things that you learn also, and it's, it's part of opening you up and making you a more open person. And those are skills that you will use in interviews later on. Um, I had a student this semester, he, we, right after the midterm he did good on the midterm like over 90 percent but he told me i really want to get a hundred percent on the on the final exam what tell me what i need to do to get a hundred percent i want that perfect score and i said don't try to get the perfect score this you know our time is better spent than aiming for this this perfection that you so hard to achieve <laughs> and it's not worth your time and if you don't make it you're going to be so sad just try to do good and then spend the rest of your time, you know, having fun, making friends. There's so many other clubs and organizations you can take part on campus for things that you're interested in. Make sure you have a, a balanced life. You know, there are weeks where you have to study a lot, but then over the course of your studies, make sure that you do a lot of other things too to have, a, you know, many things in your brain. Uh, but perfection and grades is really not what you should be after. Otherwise, you'll how end up did, uh, being stressed. Dorothy, how did how did they respond to that advice? 
They never answered back. <laughs> so I think that's the I was the just hard thinking part. that ever that really long email to don't go for perfection, then they didn't answer back. But yeah. they're still in my class. Maybe they're hearing this today. <laughs> just, yeah. Well, then I think that's great advice. I mean, I think I think that sometimes as it was for this girl to hear that she had angry face, you know, students have difficulty thinking it's okay not to be perfect when it is it, it, it is okay. I mean, I I think that I think discipline is important. Discipline is important in having balance in life. It, it's discipline is important in, you know, I really don't want to eat healthy, but I should. It takes discipline to eat healthy. Um, and, and, and I think it's hard for students where we are so much wiser when we're older. I just wish there's a way we could bottle old advice and put it in yeah. pill form for young people so <laughs> that, that they get it. But I guess I guess, you know, town hall with grad dean is this in pill form. David, what do you think? I I, I think you guys hit on a very a lot of really good points. What what I would say, and and, and I I I would say this to anybody, but one of the pieces of advice that I think uh, everybody should should take away from from their time here and, and even out in the employment world is don't be afraid to take those those horizontal assignments. Oftentimes, I'm talking to students about their career path, and you know they're focusing on. You know, okay, I start here as an analyst and I'm gonna go up to a senior analyst and I'm gonna go director and, I'm gonna, and, and so forth. Um, but one of the things that I, I say is, you know, take those assignments that are horizontal that are a little bit uncomfortable. Um, even in the classrooms, you're gonna take courses where an assignment back to Dorothy's point, it, you may not be the best, like the student who, who didn't do so well as, as he wanted to in the midterm. It's okay to be a little uncomfortable because those are sometimes some of the best learning experiences that you can have. Um, I know throughout my career, uh, on the business side, um, I was constantly taking horizontal um, appointments or roles just to learn more that were completely out of my comfort zone. I mean, when I went into demand management for uh, L Brands and then later at Abercrombie and Fitch, I hadn't, didn't have a clue. I was an operations supervisor in a distribution center, and I just happened to be kind of good with Excel. And they said, "Hey, you want to go do be a demand manager?" And I'm like, "Sure, I don't know what it is, but yeah, I'll go do it." And it was just a, a horizontal one. Um, and I think back to the things that we've been talking about, and particularly for students who are international, and I realize how challenging that can be to step out of your, your comfort zone, but take that, uh, take that courage to do that. Um, I can guarantee from a, from a professional standpoint, when you go up before in your employers from a talent assessment uh, standpoint, when you go in through managers sit down all the time and assess their talent for promotion and, and, and higher level responsibility, folks who have broadened out their experience base and their skill sets by taking those kind of uncomfortable assignments are going to be heads and shoulders above their peers who have stayed focused right within their single single area. Yeah, and that, Dave, that's, I think that's that would a be really mine. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that students think that they need to know everything, how to do everything about a job. Yeah. You're not going to know how to do everything about a job. So again, that's pressure to be perfect in your job. You really need to look for those stretch opportunities that are really going to um, going to enhance your profile and make you promotable within an organization. Um, so I have I have one final question for both of our um, our, our guest speakers today. Um, so. So Dorothy, I have to uh, laugh at you a little bit. Um, there's a certain video out there about you reading your rate, my professor, which is absolutely <laughs> delightful. So students that are watching, if you haven't, go find that. It is absolutely hysterical and precious. Um, so I want to know, um, Dorothy, from you and David, from you as well, what do you think is the most incredible aspect of the Jindal School and why do you like uh, being in front of students and teaching here. I love the, am I, no, I'm not muted. Uh, I love the diversity in the classroom. I love that we have students from all over the world. Um, and yeah, I, this is making for a really rich uh, group of people in front of you in terms of national origin, but also in terms of experience, languages, um, I've taught in four other institutions and I never had that, just uh, uh, such a diverse group in front of me. Uh, I teach mostly in the um, supply chain program, but also in the MBAs. Um, there it's more like backgrounds that are very different um, and skill sets. So yeah, I think 
that's what I enjoyed the most is really and and that take that as an opportunity for me to learn from the students also. And so there yeah, are some I think, that know some topics better than me and they let me know. <laughs> I love that. I, I love that answer. I, I think that is one of our greatest characteristics as a school of management. David, what about you? What's the thing that you like most about teaching here? Well, I know this is going to sound like a cliche, but no, it really is our students. And back to, to what Dorothy's point was as well, this the diversity and I don't mean diversity in, in, in more of a traditional or or, or uh, popular definition. I mean the diversity of the level of students that you have. We have students that have backgrounds that are coming in and four or five years experience. I teach over in the executive ed programs for the executive MBA and I may have students in there that are you know senior managers, directors, VPs. Um, I love the diversity that we have in our student body and I get across grad and undergrad teaching in both of those levels. Um, and I think it really helps to engage um, the students as well as the, the faculty member when you use those kind of experiences. So I really do like that. Uh, the other thing I like, I really like, I came from a very large traditional uh, university uh, up north. Um, but we were we were not as as I guess free or I, I don't know how to, to really vocalize this. We have a lot more freedom in the classroom. Uh, we're not held to a set curriculum. I mean, yes, we have guidelines and we have learning, you know, uh, learning assurances and, and, and course level uh, objectives, but it's not a standard pattern. And where I came from, that was the model and you didn't deviate from that. And I think because we have this more freedom to do that, we have a richer environment from a learning standpoint and an engagement standpoint that makes it just, a, a, for me personally, a pleasure um, to be a faculty member and, and to interact with the students. That, that's, yeah. that's the best I, thing that I can say. You know, Dorothy and David, those were really just terrific, terrific responses to that question. You know, from my vantage point, um, serving as um, kind of the senior associate dean here and driving, you know, a lot of business processes. One of the the great things that I get the opportunity to do is to look at all of the data that comes back in our exit surveys, and we have about ninety to ninety five percent of our students complete a very lengthy exit survey when they leave um, this university. And it is really profound to me after all the years that we've been doing it, that that when students talk about what's really significant and really what's unique about the school, what is kind of our brand, it really comes back to our faculty. Our faculty are really invested in literally the individual success of every student, but that is dependent upon the student and how much they invest and how much they are prepared and how much they they find that passion they find that energy they get engaged in student organizations but it's really remarkable i i've only been at two institutions one large private you know here at a large public um and i can tell you that i know i know people that are in my role uh, 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 I don't know, 70 universities across the United States, and then even more if you look around the world as long as I've been at this, no other school ever has it where the faculty are the most incredible asset of the graduate degree program. You know, they'll talk about networking being so great, and they'll talk about, you know, that they got a lot of good mentoring and stuff, but our faculty are our superpower. And, um, and students tell us that all the time. So if you haven't engaged your faculty and you're watching this session, we got gr many more that are like Dorothy and David that are out there that will engage with you, that will that will write that letter of, of, of recommendation for you, even if you weren't the straight A student. Um, because because that's part of why they're in it is to get to know the students and to be a part of that growing experience for the students. So I want to thank Dorothy and I want to thank David for being here today to kind of share your perspectives from in the classroom. And I guess uh, Norma, before I round this out, do we have any other questions before I kind of throw any concluding remarks on the table? We do. Um, the question that we have is related earlier to when we were talking about the COVID strain and our, our university response. Um, and this person asks, if we do not feel comfortable attending classes on campus, can we take it online? Specifically, they say if we enroll in a traditional face to face class and are then exposed to COVID and can't attend, will there be something online that we can look at? 
So if you're exposed to COVID, um, the faculty members um, are expected to accommodate a student and provide them with content that they may miss in class. But will there be an opportunity for you to sit at home and take your class remotely and it's face to face? No, we are we are going back to a face to face environment. Now that could completely change if the variant changes course. You know that could completely uh, change. And it also could be that maybe you're sitting in a class where a faculty member is willing to live stream the class. We leave that discretion to faculty, but um, but we are planning for face to face classes in the spring and hopefully the variant will not get out of control. And but if it does, we're going to respond appropriately just as we have in the last 20 months. So I hope that answered the, that question. Um, and if you do get exposed to COVID or you test positive for COVID, of course you need to self-report that. You need to let your faculty member know. You need to take uh, follow the protocol that the university expects of, of everybody to keep our environment safe. So Norma, if there aren't any other questions, I think I'll plow to uh, concluding remarks. So first of all, I want to thank all of our students for just having that that grit to hang in when everything about what you're doing has such a high level of uncertainty. Um, I think uncertainty is going to be a part of the rest of your life. Maybe not at the extreme level that it's been for the last 20 months, but I do think um, as I, I said in some recent um, graduation remarks for students, I think the, the more you are comfortable with uncertainty, the more that there are possibilities that other doors will open up and you will create opportunity because it, 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 when we're comfortable with being outside of our comfort zone and we're comfortable with not having all of the answers is when we find out what we're really capable of. And I know that when I have been stretched in those situations, I have grown the most, I have learned the most. I might have made a few mistakes in there, but I also learned from those mistakes. There's real power in 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 not being perfect and, and learning from where you could have done better. So first of all, I want to tell all of the students that are going into finals, study hard, good luck, get after it. Um, number two, I would say go home, hug your family, love on them, let them love on you, love on your dog or your cat or your girlfriend, boyfriend, partner, whatever it is. Um, and really enjoy time away from the classroom and really find a way to recharge and re-energize and come back ready to attack uh, the classroom and the learning like Dorothy said and stretch yourself uh, as David said and, and make all your dreams come true. All of it's in your control and you can make anything happen. So thank you for joining us today. If you have questions or concerns, don't hesitate to send an email to gendal at utdallas.edu. We answer all of those questions. And Norma, any final reminders before we sign off? Dorothy, David, any final thoughts before we sign off? Just good luck to everybody in the, going into finals. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Don't forget to sleep. Sleep is yeah. so important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sleep, Don't that's a really all good. Night or it never works. Yep. Yeah. A lack of sleep only it doesn't work as you get older. Let me just tell you that. Well, thank you to everyone who joined us today. If you have any questions, reach out to us. And David and Dorothy, if you'll hang on here after we go off live. Thank you, everybody. Have a great holiday. Good luck on finals.